Martin Lewis. Uh, he is right now, he's the chair of the architecture program at Iowa State. He's as well a principal of the firm of HLKB uh, at Des Moines. Uh, he has, I'm not going to go into the details, his firm and he has won several uh, awards, most notably in 1998, he won the uh, Business Week and Architectural Rec Record Award for Excellence, a 1999 AISC AIA Award for Innovative Design, as well as awards in both 1998 and 1999 from International Design Magazine. Uh, he's also been, has been, and is active in uh, architectural education. Uh, he has taken part in a lot of the AIA conventions, and in fact, he, as soon as he finishes with us, he'll be on his way to Louisville to take part in the Louisville AIA convention. And he's, we're really very fortunate to have him here, and I'd just like to introduce you all to Calvin Lewis. Thanks. Malika, thank you. As I said, Malika, thank you very much for uh, coordinating and getting this thing all arranged. I appreciate the professional job you did. And Chris Boardman, I, wherever you are, again, thanks for the invitation. Um, I look forward to participating in programs like this. Um, and lastly, and most importantly, thank you to the students for uh, not being out, probably where I would have been as I, when I was a student, out having a gay time on some Friday afternoon and a beautiful day like today and, and some other spot on campus. But uh, So thanks for uh, taking your afternoon and stopping by. The Ball State, um, uh, the connection, first connection I had with Ball State uh, was uh, Ken Carpenter uh, was, uh, I think, a chair of the department here years ago. And he came and was the chair of the department at Iowa State for a while. That a, Excellent job, and and uh, Tony Costello was uh, a uh, participant with me in the AIA ASCA conference in Bozeman, Montana, a few years ago. And so I got some connection back here, and I was very impressed with Tony and the passion he had for kind of generating public awareness uh, about architecture and. Was a real you know, proactive advocate of, of of involving you know the community in in architectural discourse. I think that's very critical because I honestly think you know, out there um, people don't know what architects do. And I've already talked to a few of you students who are in the first year and kind of trying thinking about you know, well what is this all about? What am I going to get into? And the reality is. Um, you know, architecture influences us every day, um, but you know we don't really know what architects do in general. I mean, the general population doesn't, and so uh, we're a little bit, um, you know, we're we're a little bit invisible. Uh, it only and only generically, you know, are we are people aware of us? As a matter of fact, um, I recall. Uh, we did a Meredith Corporation project in downtown Des Moines. Meredith Corporation actually is a publisher of Better Homes and Gardens magazine. And uh, they also publish Metropolitan Home. Metropolitan Home editor told me that uh, on their magazine, on the front cover, they always have those little blurbs that you know, entice you to, to, uh, to look at that magazine. And, when in fact architecture was included in those blurbs, either the term architect or architecture, their newsstand sales increased 30%. You know, so that tells you there is a latent interest, you know, in, in what we are in what we do, but I still think a, a pretty naive understanding of what it actually is. Uh, I think therefore, I think we somehow need to figure out a, a better connection. To popular culture, uh, the, the understanding the use of media, understanding how to sell ourselves and our values, and then really become becoming part of a broader educational process that isn't just internalized to university, but is you know externalized to the general community. Uh, 
and we're, we are somewhat isolated. The doctors, uh, lawyers, music, you know, most people have interaction, you know, with those professionals either many times, you know, during their life um, or every day. And, and the media certainly you know, gives, gives people opportunity to access what those people do, but um, architects are shown as, you know, sit, having some drawings under their arm or sitting at a board, but that's about as sophisticated as it, as it gets in terms of what they actually get involved in. Uh, it's, I've been in, in, involved in several uh, personality tests where they were testing architects on, on uh, kind of what type of person is in, involved in architecture. And, and this, of course, isn't absolutely true, but it was generally true that an architect kind of comes in the category of a, of a thoughtful and analytical introvert. And, uh, and uh, some, somehow, then, therefore, it's not a big surprise that we haven't made a you know, tremendous impact you know, out there you know, uh, as people and personalities you know, out, out there in the, the in, within popular culture. Uh, the, the more typical models these days you know, uh, would be maybe a, a star architect you know, who is seen kind of as a, as a cultural dictator Kind of, kind of operating independently. And uh, the other more typical model you know, would be the good old boy architect who does what he's told you know, by the client. Well, I submit that neither of these models are very effective uh, kind of in, in, a, in the day-to-day -day practice of architecture, that the model we really need to, to use is you know, the educator architect that um, really gets involved in critical dialogue, you know, internally with a firm and externally with the community they're involved in, and certainly each time they they deal with a client. That it's a it's a very much a mutual learning process. Um, it is not you imposing your will on your client, nor is it listening and doing what you're told. It is a it's a very enriching interactive process. That is the basic goal of our firm as we've kind of established our structure and priorities over the years and try and, try and do things that, that allow that kind of rich interaction to take place. We're heavily involved in the, in the community in many ways and, uh, and take the extra time to involve our staff you know, directly with our clients and, and, uh, and have extensive uh, charrette and working in interactive sessions. I mean, I know not unlike I've heard Tony describe that, that, that uh, he does in some of his community projects. The, uh, to understand kind of the work I'm going to show you, I'm going to give you just a little bit of personal perspective. I know in all the times when I was involved in bringing lectures in to uh, our program in Iowa, uh, I, I'd like to have a sense of where that person was coming from, kind of how they related to my background and, and uh, what, how they generated their value systems. Well, mine were generated, I grew up in Chicago, lived there until I went to college and moved to Iowa, went to school there and have lived in Des Moines ever since. So my experience has been a combination of urban and rural. What you don't understand is that my rural experience was living in suburban Chicago. That I lived uh, you know, kind of at the end of a cul-de-sac and there was cornfields down at the end of the street. And actually living in Des Moines, I live in a major metropolitan area you know, within the middle of a city two minutes from central downtown. So things aren't always as they seem. Um, and, uh, and my experience professionally certainly has been quite an urban kind of experience. Uh, I did go to uh, Iowa State uh, to get my education and, and actually went there to play Big 8 football at the same time. And uh, it was the only place where, that, where I was able to make that work. Uh, the, I've been married for 32 years to the same person, but I'm in the process of designing and building my own house right now, and I'm not sure I'm going to make it to my 33rd year based on that process. But I have uh, you know, four boys, 20, 28 to 15. Um, 
the, the basement of it, this is a passive solar house actually. The basin, basement of it is a two-story kind of concrete bunker that is a gymnasium. And that's my wife's uh, methodology of getting the boys to come back after they all le leave home is to have a, have a gym with a climbing wall and a basket and everything else down in the basement. So that's kind of been our lifestyle. The, uh, been an architect you know, for 30 years. Uh, I had a mentor by the name of Chick Herbert that uh, was my very first employer, and I've never left the firm. Um, I'm not a guy for a big change, I guess. The, uh, and, and his question when he started the firm is, you know, could you do uh, contemporary uh, interesting architecture in Des Moines? And certainly the common consensus at that time was no way in the world that that would be possible. But he believed it and uh, certainly positively influenced me, gave me many opportunities as a young architect. And uh, the model was a teaching studio. It was really not very dissimilar to your own studios here. Lots of interaction, lots of open environments. Now we have, you'll, you'll see it, we have no partitions around our desks. Um, you, you might uh, be, be challenged in what you're thinking from the lowest intern to the to a peer principal, and, uh, and that's the way the system works, heavily into collaboration. And the, the quote that was on the wall when I walked in to the, door, to the office the first time was, do a common thing uncommonly well, and that's kind of been our philosophy. We, uh, we, our architecture is, is really pretty basic, um, but you know, we work you know, to, uh, to try and solve all the problems consistently you know, and thoroughly. The, in 1987, the firm transitioned. Uh, Chick still was, it was a principal, but we became Herbert Lewis Cousy Blanc Architecture. And uh, our theme was new tradition. That is to say, we tried to keep the tradition of the open interactive studio. But rather than, um, even as we were growing and, and, uh, and incorporating many more people, we didn't want to change the philosophy about focusing on design. And, and the other two principals we brought in actually were the top designers from two of the, our most other competitive firms in the city that wanted to become part of our culture, and that was Rod Cruzy and Kirk Blunk. So um, you know, not only did they enhance our program, but we took, the comp we took the competition's designers away from them at the same time. And it was quite a successful operation. Uh, and we've been growing, we're about 40 people right now. Uh, we don't know how much we're going to continue to grow. We've uh, spawned most of the rest of the firms um, over the years in the city of Des Moines, and, uh, and so it, the impact is quite positive. Uh, as Malika said, I've added a new responsibility, and that is the chair of the Department of Architecture at Iowa State. I just began that process in July, uh, in addition to maintaining involvement in the practice. and. Uh, don't ask me how I'm going to do that yet. I haven't quite figured it out. But um, I'm certainly going to work, work very hard at it. I've been involved in education throughout that time with, as an adjunct faculty member and chairing the Architectural Advisory Council with the department. So I, I have a, certainly a strong interest in it. And, and really, Iowa State University is the lifeblood of, of our, of our uh, office and that most of our uh, employees come from, from Iowa State. The, uh, the, the reason I'm involved in, in the school also is that I really think optimally, it, you know, education isn't preparation for practice. I think education and practice are mutually inform each other. And I'm looking, you know, to get back closer to education in a way to help gain that richness, but also, you know, at the same time give the students and faculty an opportunity to make a more integral connection you know, to the profession so we can both learn effectively from each other you know, during the process of architectural education. The, uh, the philosophy then within the department is uh, a balance of diversity. We want to have an expertise of a broad range you know, within our department, not necessarily you know, kind of a homogeneous philosophy about you know, the way uh, architecture should be practiced or, or generated. The, uh, the issues of our architecture and, and the observations at this point are you know, pretty obvious. Um, 
in that that uh, that everything. I mean, from our perspective, everything is design. I mean, we from from our from the work that we do to the presentations that we put together to the awards, the programs we enter, everything we're doing, you know, we're we're uh, we're challenging ourselves to do the best you know design possible, and you know the parameters of that design, I mean, kind of the old traditional firmness and commodity and delight, are certainly a good place to start and certainly valid today as they were then, but. More specifically, you know, the, the context and setting is critical to our work. I mean, we deal with the basic issues of space and light and material and systems of organization, program, and, and it's generating that dynamic balance, you know, with all of those things, which is, which is the challenge. Uh, each, each project contains all of those issues. They just are weighed differently and balanced differently depending on the type of project you're, you're working on. The, uh, but the critical relationship to all of those things really is, is how they all inter interrelate, interrelate with the people and the users, and, you know, including the physiology and psychology and cultural influence um, you know, to, those, to those users, and the, uh, as well as having that piece of architecture be expression of, of the values that you know, have gone into it. To that end, uh, we have been recognized for our work. We've received over 200 design awards um, of both state, regional, and national basis over the 40-year you know, history of the firm. Five of them have been national AIA awards, actually four of them in the last four years. Um, and, and that actually is is the third most of any firm in the country. I think SOM with their multiple offices is one nine and some New York interiors firm is one five and we're next within the last four years, which we are absolutely dumbfounded by and thrilled by, you know, at the same time. You know, it's a very exciting, you know, position to be in. Over that same time, we've had national, 10 national, uh, total national awards of other varieties, including a couple uh, Business Week Architecture Awards, and then 14 you know, major kind of national publications. Over that period, an architecture magazine is going to be publishing a, a major series on the parking garages that we do this February. So uh, it's been a it's been a thrilling run, and we're pinching ourselves a little bit still. As a matter of fact, to the point that uh, we, are, we are one of the three finalist firms for the National Firm Award this year given by the AIA. And uh, Architectonica and Tigerman and McCurry are the other two firms. And uh, those are the firms that I was inviting to come and lecture in Iowa when we were first starting our practice. So we feel quite, you know, quite fortunate to be uh, even being considered in the same venue as, as firms like that. To, to this... Uh, to, you know, to show you then how these attitudes manifest themselves in work, I'm going to run through uh, some slides. I actually have quite a few slides, and I'm not going to spend much time on them each, but the reason I've done it this way, as opposed to getting into the details of the project, is again about the philosophy of the firm, which is we don't have any special projects. You know, every project that we do, we feel is worthy of our of our greatest concern, and um, and so uh, you know we we think we strive to have that balance, and we strive to have that richness on any kind of project that we do. So you'll see a broad range of projects, quite frankly, not very glamorous project types, but uh, we try to make the most out of them that we can. With that, I'll go ahead and get started. I'm going to come down here a little bit more so I can see the slides a little better myself. Uh, actually talking about, is that left one need to be focused a little bit or is that okay? In any case, you know, to talking about complete design, we were asked to do a display at uh, the College of Design Building in Iowa State that we did um, about 10 years ago. And rather than the typical, you know, get some boards and put your stuff up on the wall. We actually made a multimedia display, um, a multimedia display with slide projectors and music and, 
and jazz and whatever playing throughout the two weeks that our, that our projects were on display. And you can see on the right, you know, that uh, architects can't generally talk without the slides running, and so you, you're, you're being uh, blinded by the slide projector. This is the office. You're more likely to see fine art hung around than, than the work that we're working on, although it's plastered up all around our desks. But you notice the desks are wide open. There's, there, everybody is, is interacting with everybody else. This was, that was an old Burnham and Root building, actually, in, in downtown Des Moines. Uh, back in 97, we made the cover of architecture for the first time. As you can see, our drawing on the left is the, is the drawing of a project that, that was incorporated on the cover. We had to share it with a cow, but we didn't really care. You know, if that's what it took to get on the cover, we'll, we'll take it. But it, it does show you a little bit about the, what some of the preconceptions of uh, Muncie and, and Ames and Des Moines you know, might be out to the rest of the world. And by the way, uh, something that is, uh, it can easily be overcome. Back to the concept of things being starting from, from small things. This was a $25,000 project for a company that industrial gases and uh, and so we, you know, didn't matter. We, we took it on anyway. And uh, I think our fee was, a, I don't know, a couple thousand dollars for the project. But it ended up you know, being recognized for awards programs and things. And we had a lot of fun doing it and engaged actually the owner, you know, the industrial gas uh, company to, you know, their people to start welding things together for us and help make some of the products using their products for even some of the furniture. big piece of sheet steel that, that uh, we use their canisters to support and even use their canister for a coat hanger. And this goes back to the, to the theme, you know, that they asked me if I had a title for, for this lecture and I, I said generally we don't, but when we won a national AI award for this project, you know, they said we want you to they want, they want you to speak and we want, to, we want a title and we want some images that showed you what, that tell the story behind the project. Well, since we don't work that way, we had to do it all after the fact, the kind of post-rationalization. So we, we, we use light and motion and understanding movement, you know, certainly a lot within our work. And so we, we titled it, uh, uh, see, Measured Movement and Living Light. And the, the concept here was this was an old warehouse that, that a corporation had to move into an old existing warehouse. And, and we, you had to, we, we suggested to them we had to get daylight into that space to make it humanly habitable, which I noticed some of the design studios weren't, didn't have daylight in them when I was walking around up here. I that, found that interesting. But um, in any case, uh, the, uh, this is, we put skylights over the top. It was a tilt up concrete building that that uh, it would be difficult to get windows in, so we did it this way. And the, as the light changes, as we have different styles of lighting behind the wall, it's constantly changing all day long, you know, uh, and, and generating that light within the space. And, uh, and I'll get into the concepts of the measured movement, but this is the slide we, we generated, you know, to picked out to kind of display those concepts, you know, where really understanding you know, understanding how analytically how light works and how how you accentuate movement and understand those things, you know, is uh, is an integral part of of understanding how your architecture works, and so that's just kind of symbolically represents that. But the project, you know, was again this warehouse. The the rear end of it was a warehouse. The front end we converted then to the office space, and the light wall just kind of generates down the middle and is is overlit by skylights and the, the literally the balcony mezzanine space for the staff on this side is made out of the same shelving units that they use in the back for the storage. And this is a gas distribution company, so the main conference room you know, actually kind of visually serves as a feeder tank in the, in the mechanical system, kind of serves as a visual distribution system, not unlike their actual product usage. And the, uh, then the, the conference room is, is a double layer of 
perforated metal, so as you move around it, it moves because the moiré pattern that's generated by those two layers of, of a perforated metal, so that it's again, it's a fixed object that in fact is moving visually because you're moving around it and it's understanding again that different ways you know, to measure movement and different, different ways to comprehend movement as well as this wall because of the tapering um, length uh, you know, as, you, as you walk up and down that distribution system the scale and quality of the space you know, changes drastically and you're really much more aware of the, the passage that you're going through. And see some of the details of the of the system. Again, relatively straightforward pragmatic use of materials. Now, the next project is uh, was an advertising agency that specializes in farm products and food products. So we kind of did a did a grouping of of uh, of object buildings within the space. This was just a generic strip, you know, if you, you can see, you've seen them before, brown brick, reflective glass, you know, kind of suburban strip development. And, and so we kind of put all this, these objects on the inside, literally working out of the farm implement catalog and buying some of the products to, to put in. And this actually serves as a conference room. And the main conference room, the main board room is uh, like a, an old uh, uh, corn crib. Even the plant selection was uh, was thematic. A big working conference room for the staff, getting some light on into it on the inside of the space. But again, very simple basic use of materials. Another ad agency uh, where, you, where a lot of the existing you know, interiors were just left exposed and some, uh, even the floor that had been ripped up over time you know, was just left to add a patina to the and richness to the, to the image. And the conference, conference room and meeting room, lunch room, was a, also a creative working center for the uh, for the designers. Strip mall out in the suburbs. You know, again, another very bad kind of generic environment type. This is the front door. You come in, and and instead of kind of presenting all of the wares of the jewelry store from the outside, it kind of forces you to come in to really experience what's going on, and. Uh, and this, so you come around and then you start to experience all the rest of the, the jewelry that's on display, which was not on display when these photographs were taken. But uh, it is the concept that it's, it presents jewelry as art, you know, as opposed to putting every piece out there that you would imagine. It sets up specific pieces and makes them look that much richer. And it actually makes them look that much richer, almost in contrast to the basic crude materials that are used, um, you know, to, to set them up. This is a conference room for, uh, for law offices. Uh, I mean, sometimes the parameters are different. In this particular case, we had 90 days from the day the client walked in the door till they, had, they were splitting from their existing firm and opening up a new business. And we had 90 days from the day they walked in till they had to occupy their space. So, you know, in this case, we made lots of uh, pragmatic decisions. It was an SLM building in downtown Des Moines that had kind of a grid pattern system and we tried to do, insert some things that were a counterpoint to that system. And again, co contrast of material usage. Even though you know, the view is beyond this cur curved piece, we, we only gave you glimpses of the view until you got around and experienced it, you know, close to the glass and more dramatically, where uh, we also filtered the light at the end of the hallway, you know, with the stack glass to give it a more ethereal kind of quality. 
and even another law office, you know, that was a new young law office that wanted to make an impact, and yet it didn't want to be outlandish. And so using very basic materials, but do, doing them in ways that kind of have a legal kind of imagery, that is to say, you know, metal, um, kind of corrugated metal, but made to look like a, made to look like a fluted column and concrete block made to look like a, you know, kind of a stone courthouse kind of imagery. And even the, even the bank as a, uh, in the interior of a mall, we tried to give a little bit more up-tempo, you know, identity. But we, we do a full range of project types. We have won uh, the uh, Firm of the Year Award from a historic preservation basis in Des Moines and, uh, and won for many projects. This is, uh, we did this, this restoration for a company who uses it as an executive you know, work environment. Another one we just converted uh, for, can, would it be possible for somebody to try and focus that left slide? Uh, the, uh, this was actually, this is an old uh, existing house converted into a plastic, surgeon, a plastic surgeon's quarters. So all the different rooms off of this space are, thank you, are actually functional you know, working offices. Even to doing a paint job, this was a synagogue that uh, was kind of brown on tan on beige that uh, we went and did some research and, and just came back in and, and gave the internal space some, some hierarchy and, and uh, the arc and, and uh, formal uh, apps or front end, you know, certainly a higher identity. This is a basement, uh, was a basement of a parking garage that we converted into a uh, learning uh, teaching center for the doctors, you know, at, at a local hospital. And with the, this is the, the uh, auditorium back behind us here, but a, a big grand hall. And again, it, when I've tried to explain on these project types that I've been going through, I don't know that there's been a juicy one in the group. I mean, I don't know that you'd write back to your class members that you graduated with and say, I got to do the interior remodeling of a warehouse, you know, or I got to do a, a basement parking garage rest, you know, redo. Or, and so I, the point of that is, Again, there are no small projects. We really need to focus on designing everything. This was an addition at the University of South Dakota, uh, a new uh, library addition. And, and uh, again, this was an refrigeration warehouse where we started out the existing warehouse just by decorating the truck dock for them and then did, made an addition you know, where we actually are using the truck dock lighting and things to, to serve as light fixtures for the main entrance into the, into the office building portion. And even the, the reception desk is like one of their big cartons that they use for shipping their refrigerated material. And the, and the big refrigeration door housing the conference room. And, and uh, this is a stretch, but the, the glass block kind of strip using the image of, of uh, guess what? Ice for the refrigeration warehouse. Always light is critical. The glass block wall, this is where the windows were over here, but because the executive offices were there, we had the glass block wall to share all that daylight into the space and then added, tipped up the lung span structure to allow clear story lighting all on into the main, into the main space. And even the little conference rooms are like big storage boxes uh, from the warehouse. <laughs> Another, another glamorous project we got to remodel and add on to this existing mission church that you can see up here. But we used it, instead of tearing it down, we used it to become the old sanctuary, to become the heart and focus, you know, and, and narthex for the whole new complex. And the symbolic cruciform kind of uh, taking off of the original origin of this church. And with, with uh, Kind of a, this was out in the countryside at the time it was done, so it has a, a little bit of there's a rural kind of barn-like quality, but but because of uh, because of the special nature of it of the church, the glass chapel kind of hovers over the over the altar to give it you know much more. Um, it, it is a it is a meeting room philosophy, which is what the broad plan is about, but it also is a church and the kind of flowing space and. In an uncertain definition, you know, the soft light 
you know, in the, in the raised glass chapel kind of adds to the ethereal quality. And if, if the other image was, uh, was agrarian, this image, you know, and I, I kind of took this one from my visits to Italy, and I remember seeing the churches on the top of the hill with all the red tiled houses, you know, leading up to it. Well, this is the suburban version of, of that uh, Italian, you know, tile hillside philosophy. Even with a broad plan, you know, which, which generally doesn't have the same drama as the vertical basilica plan churches, you know, just by having the, the chapel you know, have that vertical end, you know, we try to get some of that drama back. And then the old sanctuary um, actually becomes then the common space and the narthex and the, and the center for the baptismal font, which is again the history and kind of birth, re rebirth of both symbolic rebirth liturgically and also the rebirth of the church. And how the light works and how, it, how buildings look day and night, you know, we, we're trying to always be well aware of those, that broad range of influences. Another spectacular project, we got to convert an, an alley space, you know, this is a, on a campus in eastern Iowa, uh, from an alley space actually into a kind of student gathering zone um, as part of a skywalk system. And the structural solution by having structure up the middle so it didn't, uh, could it, so it could softly attach to the other buildings, you know, kind of generated its, you know, architectural imagery. This was a particularly meaningful project for me, having kind of played football at Iowa State. I got a chance to come back and do their new athletic building on the edge of the stadium. Um, and, and we kind of added two ends around the middle of an existing building, and this is kind of the street end, and this is the ed, end that faces the athletic facility, the football stadium. As you can see here, this was the existing facility, and we kind of engulfed it with uh, promenade and, and green you know, trees to neutralize it, and, and then added you know, kind of front and rear images. This is now a weight training room, you know, so it doesn't, become, doesn't have access. The access is on either side into the building. And this actually is, uh, is the athletic building for, that houses all the athletic departments. But they actually use this, uh, we put all the lounges and, and, and executive offices at this end, so they actually use that as like a skybox on game day. I got to stand right there last Saturday and watch us almost beat Nebraska. <laughs> but guess what? We didn't again. But even the dynamics of the glass with its south orientation and sunscreens to deal with the environmental issues actually has a chameleon-like character that, you know, that actually takes and reflects the crowd and reflects the colors, in this case, the colors of the seats um, you know, from the stadium. Some details, you know, within the within the space, the the uh, auditorium kind of hung overhead. This this gambrel shape again with its Iowa agrarian background. I tried to get them to paint Iowa State red, but they thought that was taking it a little bit too far. The red red barn imagery they didn't want to sell to the recruits. But this again shows the kind of chameleon-like nature of some of the spaces we try and create, you know, how, it, how it looks in different kinds of lighting conditions, internally and externally. And sometimes a very simple use of materials. This is just a, this is a textured block, ribbed block wall that I, I think in, in my architectural career, I'm not sure I've made a wall that is any richer and and uh, stronger than that wall, and, uh, but I've used a lot more expensive materials. And then again, with this facing to the north, which would always, which would always be in shadow, 
by bowing it out and getting the skylight overhead, uh, it's always being backlit and then it also takes all the setting, rising and setting sun conditions and reflects them you know, back to the north, which is, is invariably a very difficult elevation to deal with. And, a, and a, then a sculpture of dichroic glass within the skylight itself. And these again are all functional sunscreens, uh, you know, not just, not just decoration. And this is an athletic building we did at the University of Iowa. So, but since I didn't play football there, I'm not going to show as much of that one. A simple project, uh, you know, this is a, a lecture place for students uh, uh, at the University of Iowa. It's again, a wide spot at the end of a at the end of an alley that we converted into an amenity for, uh, for the students. More aggressive kind of planning. Uh, this, is the, this is downtown Des Moines, the two rivers that go through the city. This, these two drawings are generated by Mario Gandosonis, who is a planner and architect from Yale University. Uh, he, was, he was actually hired by the Graham Foundation to come in and do a three-year study of Des Moines as a prototypical American city to find out kind of where it needed to go and what was happening in a prototypical American city. And then, then his work was actually on display in an international display, uh, you know, around the world on a, uh, in a uh, show that was curated by the Contem Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles called Urban Revisions. And Des Moines was one of the projects as part of that program, but what this shows, we have, a, we have a capital building in downtown Des Moines, Axial, down through the middle of town, kind of a, a CBD, a Polk, Polk County Courthouse with an axis in the other direction, and his work is very graphic, just trying to find the, where are the priorities, you know, within the, the natural setting of downtown. And then we got involved with the actual one piece of it, which was an amphitheater that I'll show you later on the river, and also this, this gateway park that was kind of an anchor at the west end of this main axial drag on the state capitol. Uh, showing the kind of the big picture systems of, uh, of distribution from the airport, from the downtown, from the western residential area, all kind of coming together at this at this uh, urban park, showing again what the kind of existing density is with this figure ground diagram to what, you know, what was, is then planned to be generated as part of this plan with, with islands of development, public uh, entities, uh, library, you know, continuing education building inside the park, but a six block long you know, open park otherwise, then this is a model inserted into the plan of downtown Des Moines showing some Kind of general projection of what it might be. And we've done the buildings at this end, uh, you know, of the project and this end of the project, well, sh which I'll show you in more detail. This is the one at the west end. This is what it looked like, uh, you know, before. And this is now the new gateway into downtown. If you remember all those streets coming together, kind of gather at this new entry experience. And this Meredith Corporation project, which we did years ago, we've added on to and kind of trait tried to create a major urban kind of front room, you know, kind of vestibule for entry into the major downtown city. It's again building as space maker, not building as object. And tried to, even, even though we didn't want to compete with the original tower and facade of the original building, we were trying to be sympathetic to the fenestration pattern and, and, uh, and, and and uh, kind of proportion of openings. At the same time, this is a daylight building. This is a daylight screen that is bouncing and shading all of these windows. This building is saving 30% of its annual energy bill. It, it got a regional top energy saving award and it'll pay back all of its infrastructure in two years you know, that, that was used. So it, uh, it's not just about image, it's about, it's about function. I'm going to go through these relatively quickly, but these are just some images of the building. Creating a light court 
you know, which the building works around, and moving all of the offices internal so the daylighting will work around the perimeter. This was the history of the, of the building um, before we actually added the addition onto this side. This is what it looked like before we were involved. This was back in the late 70s. This is some of the earlier work we had done on the building. Um, would you put in those other two trays, please? Meredith Corporation is a, as a publishing company, as I said, and a lot of their, uh, half of their staff is in New York. And so they asked us to give them a environment that was, um, that when the people came in, the staff would come in from New York, they would, they would uh, think that they had not come, you know, to some backward environment in Des Moines, but was comparable to what they might have experienced in the city. So we were, um, that what that's what led to a lot of that kind of image decision making, you know, of the uh, of the light courts and things within that project. This is the project actually at the under, other end of the Gateway Park, which is where one was a corporate building. This is a developer building. And uh, you know, much simpler, but still trying to blend into its street context and, and massing of the surrounding buildings. Another project actually is, uh, is this one in the distance was a, was a building that we actually built the base of, a three-story granite base, and the owner then asked us to add on top of it, which we had structured it for, but we'd only structured it for this many floors, and to add this many more, we had to lighten the skin and go with a, with a glass skin, but, it, but they wanted it to have the imagery of the old limestone or the old uh, granite base down below. So even within a, within a glass system, uh, it still has a kind of punched opening imagery from a distance, but from up close, um, this, was the, this is an upper atrium in the building. From up close, you can see you know, how it has the chameleon-like character of, of reflective glass uh, when, you add, when you look at it at a flat angle, so it kind of has multiple images. All the way back to, this was one of our first AI awards, a restoration project that we did uh, on an old Art Deco building that was ready to get the wrecking ball when we helped uh, the bank resurrect it. All the way to a downtown civic center in the city. These are kind of the urban, and, and also a new, a new front on the, uh, this is Des Moines version of an auditorium. We actually call it the largest <laughs> two-car garage in the world, but this is the, the new lobby we added in front of it, and Skywalk system, as well as the Riverfront Amphitheater that I had mentioned you know, before. So those are the, those are the kind of urban, and, and this is a project. Um, this is a, uh, a bridge tent for uh, for this bridge that's going to house uh, riverfront celebrations for the city. This is not complete yet. And this is a project I think some of you might have seen. It was just published. It's, it's called Sticks. A local artist actually creates uh, 
art and furniture out of, uh, literally out of sticks and found objects. And this, this, uh, this uh, gallery at the north end is where they all work in this open glazed space. And the warehouse, which is just a tilt up prefab, uh, pre-engineered building, kind of attaches down at the far end. And this was, again, in a, in a suburban development that, that, that just happened to have a lot of trees on it. And we saved nearly all of them. But a very, again, very utilitarian building type. But the artist actually then painted all of the doors you know, kind of with her uh, artistic style. Inside of that painting, you know, the painting gallery space. Drying areas, all the utilitarian areas within the within the faculty, or excuse me, fa facility, and then <clears throat> and a very generic project type, which is parking garages, which we've done quite a few of. I, I, in Architecture Magazine is going to publish, I think, all four of these that I'm going to show you in their February issue. But it's a, we start with a very simple premise, you know, of a massive and very efficient parking garage, and then add on the necessary other things. In this case, this is a daycare center, and there's actually a bus uh, drop-off. It's an intermodal facility where people park here and then get distributed to the rest of the facility. And then the signage, um, we wanted to make sure they knew what this was for. But even as a metal kind of clad building, it's still relatively quiet. It within the, and and the, the bay patterning of it is still consistent with the bay patterning of you know, many of the other buildings, even though it's a parking garage, which normally has a whole different kind of perspective and proportion to it. Again, very basic materials chain link and, and grid, you know, you know, metal grids. Another one, uh, this, that was downtown Des Moines. This is at the University of Iowa, some of the same kind of vocabulary. Another one at the University of Iowa, again, where the context is really more about proportion than it is about material. We didn't need to have it be out of brick to have it be compatible and quiet, you know, within that setting. And it's multiple use. It actually is a recreation deck and a chiller plant and actually a water storage plant in addition to being a parking garage. And the circulation becomes usable by the entire campus, not just for the parking garage. And this is the brand new one with a glass skin, two-story expression to the campus side and a big steep downhill. And this is the back side. Uh, that actually has a copper skin on it because it needs wanted to be quiet in a green hillside that you can't really see. And then a couple of the chiller plants again added as part of the massing. And this marks the exit and entrance you know, into the parking garage you know, between the chiller plants. Some of the detailing. This is uh, nearing completion right now. We also have collaborated with other architects. In the case of Frank Gehry, you don't collaborate with Frank. You do his bidding. But it was an interesting experience nonetheless. That's the project at the University of Iowa we did with him a few years ago. This was as he was just starting to get into his, uh, his kind of curvilinear work. Uh, this was kind of his first version of it. As you see, he's gone crazy since then. But it was a, it was very, uh, you know, uh, it was a very interesting and valuable experience for us. And we take on these when we think that you know, we can learn something from We've worked with Maya Lin. This was a sculpture in downtown Des Moines at, at an office building. We kind of helped her accomplish. Mary Miss, this is at our art center. We helped again do all the drawings and kind of conceptual, helped her with uh, realizing her conceptual ideas. We've, we're currently working with David Chipperfield from London on, a, on an art museum in, Des Moines, in Davenport and with Stephen Hall on an art building at the University of Iowa. 
This is also part of that Mary Miss project. So we, we don't do that often, but we do it when we think we can learn from it. And back to kind of the basis of what architecture was. If you remember after I told you what the issues were, I tried to relate it back to the human you know, side and the personal side. And this is an expression of that. This is a, this is a greenhouse at a, at a home for troubled youth and it, it's to provide horticultural therapy for them so they learn nurturing skills. And it also is a little bit of a clubhouse for them to go and play music and kind of get away from it all. And this was actually donated by a friend of mine whose uh, son, who I knew well, uh, died of, of uh, youth, di youth diabetes uh, suddenly. And so they donated this uh, to, the, to the community and for the troubled youth. And then we donated our services to get this accomplished as well. So in the end, it, it's still about people. It's still about making those connections. And, and uh, I think, to, to conclude, I think that in, in 1997, we won two National AI Awards, and we were, again, very fortunate to, to do that. At that year, there were 28 awards given, uh, and uh, let me get, finish these slides first. And uh, that's, from, that's with, uh, that includes interior design and architecture and planning. And um, and with, uh, with those 28 awards that were given that year, 28, 26 of them had oceanic coastlines. And two of them were our two in, in Iowa. And so uh, as a message, um, if it's possible in Iowa, it's possible any place, you know, I think. And, and architecture, you know, really to that end isn't, it's, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. It's something that you have to stay committed to for a, over a long period and work, very, work at very hard. It's, a, it's exhausting and exhilarating, you know, at the same time. I, I had a cousin who was a, kind of advised a major uh, corporations and uh, institutions on how to invest you know, all of their money. And he came to visit and was very wealthy, did, has done extremely well for himself. And he came to visit me one time and uh, I showed him around and all the projects that I had been fortunate enough to be involved in. And, and a, he kind of had a blank look on his face you know, after the, the tour and, and uh, he said that he had never felt so empty in his life, that he had worked hard and earned all the money but that I was so very fortunate, you know, to have this legacy, you know, that I've been able to be involved in you know, over my life and, and leave and, and really be able to share my effort, you know, so, so well with, or so much with others. And I guess leave you with that, you know, with that message that, uh, you know, there's a richness and a nobility about what we do as architects that, you know, goes well beyond the, you know, the dollars that are earned. Thank you very much. I, you know, I realize that, you know, I, I prefer, you know, dialogue in these circumstances. It's hard to do that with a large group, but, uh, and generally when you ask for questions, none are asked, but I, <laughs> if you want to, you're, you're welcome to, or if you just want to come up and ask me something afterwards, you're welcome to as well. But thank you very much.